Good morning, friends. The few and the faithful. Thanks for coming to church. Let's stand together and begin our service. Come, Christian, join to sing. Hallelujah, amen. Loud praise to Christ the King. Hallelujah, amen. Let all with heart and voice before his friend rejoice. Praise is his gracious choice. Hallelujah. Amen. Come lift your hearts on high. Hallelujah. Amen. Loud praise is fill the sky. Hallelujah. Amen. He is our guide and friend. To us he'll condescend, his love shall never end, hallelujah, amen, praise yet our Christ again, hallelujah, amen, life shall not end the strain. Hallelujah, amen. On heaven's blissful shore, his goodness we'll adore, singing forevermore. Hallelujah, amen. Amen. Why don't you take two seconds and say hello to someone, and then we'll start our service. And you can be seated, please. the church service here at Hickton Free Methodist Church. It's good to see everybody and a special welcome, a special hello to our friends who are watching this online. Um, it's so good, the um, technology we have today that we can reach out to people all over the world. So welcome to you too. Um, we do have quite a few announcements this morning in our bulletin. A couple that you already know about. We, ha we want to give a wedding gift to Amber and Brandon. So if you'd like to participate in that, uh, just put your donation on the back table. Or you can donate online if that's how you usually um, send in your offerings. We also have a baby shower coming up for Carolyn Cole on Saturday, May 28th at 2 o'clock. And if you have any questions about it, um, just talk to Janice Snyder. But it's great that we are going to be celebrating a young couple getting married and also new babies coming. It, that's, a, that's a blessing in our church. Also, we are going to be raising funds for our community summer event that we're going to have down the road. And so we're going to have a yard sale on Saturday, June 18th um, here at the church. So if you have good quality, saleable items, um, you can bring them to the church, call ahead to make sure someone's here. And if you could help out that day, please talk to Carol Bake or Bev Rorabeck. Our friend Brenda Mackay, who has grown up here in the church, is now um, going out to uh, Nanaimo, BC 
to serve there in the medical team and um, if you are able or interested in supporting her um, there's information sheets at the back table um, so you can um, donate to that to help provide um, things that she might need while she's there. Uh, we're also updating our uh, contact information for everybody in the church and I know I've had a change since um, I've moved departments. So if you have any changes in your contact information on, in your bulletin, you can fill that out and um, please list your changes, who you are, your address, email address, whatever you have, and put it on the back table so we know how to contact you if needed. And also, our Pastor Kevin will be away at a conference retreat this coming Thursday to Saturday. So if you need anything at all, you can feel free to contact either Pastor Andrew or Pastor Josh. And it does say here, any board member. So that might include me. I don't know how much help I'll be, but <laughs> contact me. I'm, I'm available. Um, and I think that's all for our announcements today. Our call to worship, which helps us. Um, I actually was about visiting family about two hours away from here yesterday, right in the middle of that horrific storm we had. And there was nothing on earth I've ever seen like that. And through our week, we get discombobulated about some things. We watch the news and it can be very discouraging, but here we have an opportunity to quiet ourselves, to really uh, ponder why we are here. And we're here to worship our God who takes care of us through, through all of life's ups and downs. So our call to worship today is from Psalm 9, verses 1 to 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. If you're able to, let's stand for worship. did not wait for me to draw near to you, but you clothed yourself with frail humanity. You did not wait for me to cry out to you, but you let me hear your voice calling me, and I'm forever grateful. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. You did not wait for me to draw near to you, but you clothed yourself with frail humanity. You did not wait for me to cry out to you, but you let me hear your voice calling me, and I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. 
I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine for thee all the follies of sin I resign my gracious redeemer my savior art thou if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my part. On Calvary's tree, I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus. I love thee in life, I will love thee in death, and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath, and say, cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. And in mansions of glory and I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I fixed upon, mount of thy redeeming love. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free 
Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. Come thou found, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou found of our Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Come thou found, come thou king. Come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you. Sing, come thou fount of our blessing. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. Amen. You may be seated, please. Okay, good. Bill Gates was once asked why he didn't believe in God. And this was his response. Just in terms of allocation of time resources, sounds like Bill Gates already, doesn't it? Religion is not very efficient, he says. There's a lot more I could be doing on a Sunday morning. He basically said that it's a waste of time to spend time worshiping and serving God. He had better things to do, like making money. He seems to be unaware of the Bible's teaching about the rich fool. Yet, most people on our planet think that Bill Gates has it right. Sunday has lost its sanctity. Sunday has become a secular day. Sunday morning is a time for sports activities. It's become a time for shopping. If you work in retail, it's very hard to get Sunday morning off. And it's not that your coworkers want to go to church. That's not it at all. It's so that they can spend time at the beach or sleeping in or recovering from the party the night before. And that mindset isn't limited to the people outside the church. Christians, too, that mindset is becoming more and more pervasive. Even outside of COVID, the idea of keeping Sunday set aside for God has become less and less important. In 2016, so six years ago, the Deseret News Agency polled 
1,000 evangelical Christians, 250 Mormons, and 250 Jews. That's three groups that traditionally place a high value on Sabbath observance. So 1,500 people. 50% of those respondents said that Sabbath observance has a spiritual meaning for them. That means the other half would say no. Not so much, not for me. By the way, that same poll was conducted in 1978, and 74% in 1978 said the Sabbath has a high value to them. So let's do something together. Let's do something weird together. If you're holding anything in your hand, put it down, especially if it's your phone or your tablet. If you're holding anything in your hand, put it down. This may seem wacky, but just work with me here. Together, we're going to take five deep breaths. We're going to do it together. You're going to breathe in through your nose and exhale through your mouth. I'm going to walk you through it. Ready? If it helps to close your eyes, go ahead and do that. Okay, ready? Breathe in. Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Breathe in. Weird? A little weird? Refreshed? Wished you hadn't had that leftover pizza for breakfast? <laughs> Wished you weren't wearing a mask? <laughs> well, today, we're talking about God's gift of rest. We're going to see that when he created the world and when he created humans, he created an entire day of the week for us to take a deep breath let it out. It's not a day set aside for doing nothing. When we were breathing just then, we weren't doing nothing. We were actively doing something. We were actively resting. We were actively calming ourselves down. Well, what if you could have 24 hours of deeply restorative rest every week? That's the gift that God has built into the fabric of life of the natural world. And it's a gift. It's the gift of rest. And by the way, for those of you that are retired, this goes for you too. Because sometimes I look at our world, and I know some of you, and I know some of you very well, you're busier than me. <laughs> Just because you're retired doesn't mean you don't need a day of rest. So we're continuing in our sermon series on the Ten Commandments, and today finds us at commandment number four. The Ten Commandments are posted, recorded in two places in the Bible, in the Old Testament. They're in the Exodus account that we've been studying, and they're posted again over in Deuteronomy chapter five. And those two accounts articulate God's reasons for why people should observe the Sabbath, why should we honor the Sabbath. I read this in a book I was reading recently, and I'm going to use this phrase. There are twin engines pushing God's people forward into the rest that they need, but they so often push against. Our passage in, here in Exodus 20 tells us that the first engine pushing our rest is that we're created for it. We are created for rest. I'm reading Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. By the way, that's pretty much everybody right there. 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Isn't it interesting that the writer of this, who tradition says it's Moses, uses the word remember. Remember to keep it holy. The fourth command is now putting into law something that existed for a long time. This is the only one of the commandments God gave to Israel before arriving here at Mount Sinai, where God is laying out the Ten Commandments. In fact, the reason that Moses says nobody should work on the Sabbath is because God set it up that way. He built, it in, a, he built in a day where he rested. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and then God rested on the seventh day. Folks, if it's good enough for God, <laughs> it's good enough for us. This word, Sabbath, comes from the Hebrew word, Sabbat, and it literally means he ceased creating. He ceased creating. He didn't cease ruling and reigning. He just sat down and he presided over his creation. Why did he do that? I mean, he's God. He wasn't tired, right? Sometimes we get to our day off and we're tired. God wasn't tired at all. It's not like he needed a break. Why did he rest? Well, I think we can take an implication from Scripture that he rested in his accomplishment. It was a rest of accomplishment. It was taking time to enjoy what he had made. It's like building a fire pit in your backyard and then resting by building a fire and calling your friend and say, let's have s'mores or wieners at the fire, right? I made this beautiful fire pit. I am man, I made fire. Let's eat. And it's this rest of achievement. It wasn't a rest of inactivity. It was a rest of achievement. And that rest, he's calling us to do the same. Just a few chapters earlier in Exodus 16, the Hebrews were wandering around in the wilderness and God makes a point to say, I'm going to provide quail and manna for you every single day. You just got to get out there, grab it, and eat it. But don't store it up, God says. Except on the sixth day, I want you to go and get two days' worth. And go ahead and do your cooking because nobody's going to cook on the Sabbath. The seventh day is a holy day to the Lord, which means he called everyone to rest. I don't want you to gather your manna. I don't want you to cook it. I want that all to be done so that you actually have a day of rest. I love that. Sabbath was a holy day to eat leftovers. Isn't that good? <laughs> but even there in the wilderness with that double portion of Swiss chalet that God gave us, God is reinforcing something he had already introduced. He says, remember how I created the world, and on the seventh day I rested. I want you to do the same thing. The Sabbath day reminds us that we were created to rest, and that's the first engine that points us to a Sabbath day. During the French Revolution, when they tried to de-Christianize France, they actually passed a law outlawing the Sabbath day. And they didn't know how they were going to enforce it, so what they did is they changed the calendar. They wanted people to work, so they created this thing that you can Google, it's called the French Republican Calendar. Basically, it operated on a 10-day week. And this new calendar was installed in November of 1793. But 24 months later, they had to reinstate the seven-day week because the health of the nation had totally collapsed. People needed rest. Humans were created for a day of rest. 
So that first engine is that we were created to rest. Let me show you the other engine propelling us forward. In the Deuteronomy account of the Ten Commandments, he gives us another reason why we are to rest one day in seven. This is verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 5. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Excuse me. Here, God is reminding them that there was a time when they couldn't rest. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't rest. In fact, part of the very nature of oppression is the withholding of rest. God is saying, I brought you out of that captivity. So when you practice the Sabbath day, you aren't just receiving the rest that you were created for, engine number one. You're receiving the rest that he saved us for. We were redeemed to worship. We were, that rest was redeemed for us. The Sabbath day reminds us we were redeemed to worship our God. And that's the second engine. We were created for rest, and we were redeemed to worship God. That's why we worship on the Sabbath. Now, the New Testament adds a lot of fuel to this second Sabbath engine of redeemed worship. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus' disciples are picking grain on the Sabbath. <gasps> and the religious leaders come on out and they accuse them of breaking the fourth commandment. And Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So then, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. You see, the Sabbath is a gift of, from God, not a burden. It was designed to bring God's people closer to him. And you don't earn a gift, you receive a gift. And these religious leaders were really good at turning God's gifts into burdens. <laughs> they were experts at it. And Jesus, rightfully, was angry with them for that. Because the Sabbath was created for rest and delight, and it had become a hollowed-out, work-based tradition. I have a lot of, or I had a lot of friends that were Jewish when we lived in the metro New York area. A lot of my friends were Jewish, and a few were Orthodox Jews. And they constantly tried to one-up each other at being better Jews. Well, I don't even brush my teeth on the Sabbath. Oh, well, I don't brush my teeth and I don't wash. Sometimes I just stay in bed all day because the act of getting out of bed, I'm not exaggerating to you, the act of getting out of bed is work. And so people had this works-based mentality around observing the Sabbath. And that's what these Pharisees, these religious leaders had here. They weren't delighting in the Sabbath at all. They didn't recognize they were created for rest. They weren't set aside in time to worship God. A couple of decades later, after Jesus made this statement recorded in Mark, Paul was writing to the Colossian church, the church in Colossae, and he said this, Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or new moon or Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, Christ has fulfilled the law that Moses laid out. Their purpose, those laws, was to point us to Christ. So while you're not bound to a Friday sundown to Saturday sundown kind of Sabbath like the people of Israel were, show grace with how you work out this Sabbath. And I love this. This is not an original thought of mine. I read it this week and included it in the sermon. Here's Paul's bigger point. The Sabbath day is a shadow of the Sabbath God. I'm going to say it one more time. The Sabbath day is a shadow of the Sabbath God. When Jesus says in Mark 2, he is Lord of the Sabbath, he's saying he's the God of rest. 
No wonder he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Sabbath is a signpost pointing us to Christ. And just as God brought the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt, he's brought you and I out of slavery to our sin. Sin that constantly makes us anxious, wondering if we're doing enough, achieving enough. Sin, just like a slave master, asks more and more of us. And Jesus says, I have come to liberate you. I've come to give you freedom from the bondage of sin. And you can rest in me, finally. Those are the twin engines pushing our practice of a weekly day of Sabbath. We're created for rest, and we're redeemed for worship. I often tell you that I preach to me first and you second. I say that often. Never was this more true than this week. I found myself preparing a sermon that I desperately need myself. I don't practice this weekly rhythm of rest and worship nearly enough. And I had to ask myself the question, why? Why is it so hard to take a day of rest? You know, my pat answer when someone on the board says to me, um, are you resting, Kevin? Because they do, they challenge me all the time. I said, well, I love my job. <laughs> and I do love my job, but that's not an excuse to overwork, right? <laughs> so here's what I came up with. Answering the question, why is it so hard to take a day of rest? Here's what I came up with, two answers. The first is, I have a poor theology of work. My ideas of work are whacked in the head. But up there I said, what is your theology of work? Because I don't think it's just me. I think we all have a poor theology of work. One of the most telling things about our culture is we go somewhere and we're meeting new people and one of the first three questions that we ask that person is, what do you do? And we equate people's identity with their work. And if you're retired or just a mom, <laughs> oh, I'm just retired. I don't do anything. Or... I'm just a mom. I just stay home with the kids. Mm -mm. And it's embarrassing to not be able to say, I'm vice president of computer programming of blah, 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 blah. Right? But if we have a title, you know that's going to come right out there, right? That's a poor theology of work when we assign value to people based on what they do. The second reason I came up with is we have a poor theology of rest. Tell me if this tracks with you. In our day and age, we really don't take work off, except for maybe a vacation. I was chatting with a fellow pastor recently who gets four weeks of vacation, and he told me it takes him 15 days did you say 15? 10. ten to, to get my math right here. Takes him 10 days, takes him two weeks of his vacation to unwind enough that he's not thinking about work, that his knot in his stomach isn't going. This is a pastor. So can you imagine having a stressful job? <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> takes him 10 days to get into vacation mode. And then he said, and five days before I go back to work, I'm starting to think about work, starting to think about what's waiting for me and what didn't get done while I was there and the emails I need to write, and his knot arrives. So in his 28 days, he got 13 days of rest. So in one sense, he's making a very smart decision. Rather than taking four individual weeks throughout the year, and never really resting. He's forcing himself to at least get some rest. But that is not a good theology of rest. 
what used to be an on-off switch, I'm working now, I'm not working, I'm working now, I'm not working, has become more of a dimmer switch. Oh, now I'm resting a little more and working a little less. Oh, now I'm working a little more and resting a little less. And we can blame technology, I think, for part of that. There isn't anywhere you can go where someone doesn't have your cell phone number or can't go online and find out where you are. Your email's always accessible. I know this because I was laying in the hammock with my grandson two weeks ago on my phone checking my email. My grandson's tugging on me, come on, play with me, play with me, and I'm chatting with a board member on a Saturday. Last week I had a bad night's sleep. We all get bad night's sleep, don't we? They're nothing new. I went to bed at 9 o'clock, which is the time Karen and I go to bed every night, and fell asleep almost immediately, woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, which is not uncommon, right? Most of us wake up at some time because there's another room in the house that we have to visit. So waking up in the middle of the night, not uncommon. But my brain turned on. Oh. <laughs> And I started to think of all the things that I had forgotten to do the day before. The meetings that I had to prep for coming up in the coming days. All the emails I still had to return or the emails I needed to initiate. The seniors I haven't visited often enough as much as I'd like. I began to ask myself why people aren't coming back to church if we've lost some families permanently. You know how the brain works, right? And before you know it, I'm wide awake. What started as just a thought became the list. <laughs> I say it like that because Karen will say to me the next day or any, any morning, how'd you sleep? Well, I, I, I didn't have a good sleep. Why not? And I'll just answer, the list. And she'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So... Nothing worked. Counting backwards from a thousand didn't work. Counting sheep didn't work. Deep breath exercises didn't work. I am wide awake, and I figure if I'm wide awake, I might as well have a coffee. So on Wednesday, my work day began at 3 o'clock. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about, right? With Lynn, it's cinnamon toast. <laughs> and my work day began 3 o'clock on Wednesday morning. At 7 o'clock Wednesday night, do you think I was getting behind the wheel of a car to come to Josh's Bible study? <laughs> Ain't no way I was here <laughs> for that Bible study. Did, did anyone come on Wednesday? Was it awesome, as usual? Yes. yes, I know. I take great joy in the fact that he's recording them, so I will catch up. Maybe that's just me, but that's what happened. I couldn't turn it off. And I highly doubt that that's just me. Somehow we've got to understand that our theology of rest needs to change from an idea that rest is what we do when we're not working to rest, this thing that we were created for, this thing we were redeemed to experience as worship is meant to restore us. If I could turn my brain to not just my sleep on Wednesday night, but my thought about Sabbath into I need this because I get to be restored. My life would change. In that sense, rest is not a byproduct of work, but work is a byproduct of rest. If I could make that switch, if you could make that switch, wouldn't our lives be better? Today's sermon wasn't sponsored by Netflix or Apple TV or Hulu. This isn't a green light, just veg out. You may need some of that, but inactivity isn't the goal. Restoration of your soul is the goal. You were created and redeemed for it. Okay, now everyone reach for your bulletin. Did everyone get a bulletin when you came in?
Toki Mayamisha, a Japanese poet, created a version of Psalm 23 that he labeled Psalm 23 Reimagined for Busy Plagued People. <laughs> it's on the back of your bulletin. Let's stand and read it together. If you're able to stand, you don't have to stand. And let's not rush through it. The Lord is my pace setter. I need not rush. He makes me stop and rest for quiet intervals. He provides me with images of stillness, which restore my serenity. He leads me in ways of efficiency through calmness of mind. His guidance is peace. Even though I have a great deal of things to accomplish each day, I will not fret, for his presence is here. His timelessness, his importance will keep me in balance. He prepares refreshment and renewal in the midst of activity. By anointing my head with oils of tranquility, my cup of joyous energy overflows. Such harmony and effectiveness shall be the fruit of my hours, for I shall walk in the pace of the Lord and dwell in his company forever. Amen. For me, I love the la second last line. For I shall walk in the pace of the Lord. That's what the Sabbath is. The pace of the Lord says, work for six days. And then sit back and enjoy a Sabbath of accomplishment. And just rest. And it's a gift. Amen? Let's pray. Father, this is one of those sermons, one of those messages that you need to seed deep. We need to understand your pace in our lives. Help us all to receive the gift of your rest. Father, as we try to observe your law and recognize that it's for our own benefit, would you help us, Lord? It's not something we can do in our own strength, and it's certainly anti-cultural. Our society would tell us, busy, 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 job, 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 position and title. And you say, just rest. Enjoy my pace. So teach us, we pray. For your sake and for ours. Amen. Keep standing. We're going to worship now. Once again, I pour out my heart, for I know that you hear every cry. You are listening, no matter what stage. With words that are true and a hope that is real as I feel your touch, you bring a freedom to all that's within in the same. say that 
that I'm thankful for out my heart to say that you're again, I pour out my heart, for I know that you hear every cry, you are listening, no matter what state my heart is in, you are faithful to answer words that are true and a hope that is real as I feel your touch you bring a freedom to all that's within in the safety of this place I'm longing say that I love you, pour out my heart, to say that I need you, pour out my heart, to say that I'm thankful, pour out my heart, to say that you're like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need says in me fulfill I need thee oh I need thee every hour I need thee oh bless me now my Savior I come to thee you can be seated
Old Testament scripture is Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For the, you, the judge of peoples, with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase, God. Our God has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. In the New Testament, we turn to James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the earthly and early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 9. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, there is a pool, called in Hebrew Bethsaida which has five porticos. In these lay many lame and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took his mat and began to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure. Carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? And what can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I'll walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, my life to declare your promise my soul now to stand. Let's stand together. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered. All I am is yours. So I'll stand 
with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all i'll stand my soul lord to you surrendered all i am is yours let this be your prayer all i am is yours jesus all i am is yours uh, we have coffee this afternoon or this morning still downstairs if you'd like to join us for fellowship and our benediction for this morning comes from Romans 8, 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor the neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Have a great week. So I walk upon salvation. Life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God. Yours all.